Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca, if we've never met before, and I'm so glad you're here. This is my YouTube channel where I talk about all things houseplants. We have a really awesome community here, and I would love for you to join us by hitting that subscribe button. Today's video is going to be a houseplant 101 video. <laughs> this is my dog, Leo. If you've never met him before, he is an attention lover, and he does not like when I film videos because my attention is elsewhere besides him. So the topics that I'm going to be covering in this video are lighting, shopping for plants, shopping for pots, and watering. So if you are interested in learning more about any of these things, definitely keep watching this video, bless you. Since this video is a houseplant 101 video, it is covering the most basic of things. So if you are a little bit more of an advanced plant parent, then this video is probably not for you. It might be just a little bit repetitive, but if you still wanna watch and hear my take on all of these things, I would love to have your input in the comments down below if I missed something and let's get right into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is lighting. And light is the most essential thing for a plant. It is the thing that keeps them alive along with water, but light is so incredibly important. It is one of the number one reasons your house plants are dying because they're not in the right place and not receiving the correct amount of light. I always like to look at light in reference to the types of windows that I have, that being the direction that the windows are facing in my house. This is a really easy way to get the right plants for your space because certain plants will thrive in certain windows. So right now, as you're watching this video, I want you to look around your house and examine your windows and figure out what direction they are facing. I know that in my house, I have an east window right here, and then I have west windows on the other side of the house. I do not have any north or south windows, only east and west, which is a good thing for the plants that I have. It's important that when we are considering plant care, we are remembering where our houseplants have come from. A lot of our houseplants come from parts of Asia, South America, and Central America. All of these places are quite tropical, and the thing about that is they are all understory plants, which means that they live at the bottom of the rainforest or wherever they are living. So that means that they are receiving dappled light from all of the plants that are living above them in their native environment. With that being said, it's important that we know that there are basically no house plants that need full sun. In fact, a lot of them would be very upset if you gave them full sun because they would get a sunburn. So just like we can get a sunburn on our delicate skin, so can our plants and they can get a sunburn a lot easier than we can. I'm always surprised by how little light my big Monstera can handle because so often she gets a sunburn just sitting in this east window. So I've had to pull her away from the window a little bit so that she's not getting so much light. And that is just something you're going to have to experiment with a lot of the time as you are going through your life with plants. Okay, so now that you know what direction your windows face, let's talk about some plants that would thrive in each window and just talk about some of the characteristics of those specific windows. Let's start with north windows. I used to have a north window in my old house and I had a lot of plants living in that window, but the thing is a north window will never get any direct sunlight coming through the window. I know that I said that plants don't like full sun, but that doesn't mean that they can't handle a few hours of sun rays on their leaves. Some plants really enjoy that, like the ficus lyrata or the fiddle leaf fig, and others really, really hate that, like the monstera, in my experience. Since north windows don't get any direct rays of light, and it is a little bit more of an ambiance of light throughout the day, plants that would do well in those windows are Sansevieria, ZZ, Syngoniums, and definitely spider plants. These are plants that can survive in a north window. Does that mean that you will be getting exponential growth in that window? Probably not. There is a myth in the plant world that there are plants that thrive in low light. And I'm here to tell you, in my experience, that is not true, that is not a thing. If you have had plants thrive in a low light situation, I'm so proud of you, that is so great, but I'm sure that they would be growing a lot faster if they were given more light. So even if the tag on the plant says that you can put it in the dark corner of your house, I still would suggest against it. The plants that I had living in my north window stayed stable for about a year. So they had little to no growth, but they did stay alive. So if that is okay with you and you have north windows, I would say the plants that I mentioned, ZZ, Sansevieria, spider plants, Syngoniums would be a nice selection for those windows. Let's talk about east windows. 
An east window is my favorite kind of window. And the reason for that is that you are getting morning light and that light is strong, but it's not very hot yet. Especially where I live, the sun gets super, super hot throughout the day. And as the sun is, you know, rising over the sky and into that west window later in the day, it has had all of that time. Hey, don't dig. It has had all of that time to heat up. So when the sun has just risen in that east window, it hasn't had all of that time to heat up. So it is intense sun, but it is not hot sun. If I could have a million east windows in my house, I would happily take that. All of my plants have always done super well in an east window. You can put a very big variety of plants in an east window, depending on how close or far away they are from the window. When a window like an east window receives all of that light, you have the option to move your plants further away from the windows. As you can see here, I have these windows on the opposite side of the east window, and that's about 10 feet. So it is definitely super far away from that window, and all of these plants over here are those quote unquote low light plants, and even though they are so far from the this east window, the light that comes in is so strong that they are still growing at a very rapid rate. West windows, like I mentioned earlier, is that hot afternoon sun. The sun has had all day to heat up. Typically the plants that will enjoy that west window are the plants that need a lot of light to thrive, survive, all of these things. South windows are a really great window to have, especially because the light is pouring into that window all day long. So the sun does not rise directly over the top of us. It kind of comes in at an angle. <laughs> you can get that visual. So those south windows are typically getting rays of light into the window all day long. This is really, really the best window if you have cactus and succulents because they need that really intense light. I've never kept cactus and succulents inside just based on where I live, but I know that people have kept their cactus in their south window and they are very, very happy there. There are also a lot of plants that can thrive in those really light heavy windows as long as they're pulled back a little bit because like I said, sunburn is definitely a thing for plants. So when you are buying a plant, it's really, really important to consider what kind of light you have in your home so that you don't buy a plant, bring it home, and it dies within a few days and you just have no idea why. Another hot tip I would love to give to you is if you are deciding whether or not a space in your home is a little bit too dark for a plant, I want you to visualize yourself reading a book or maybe actually physically take a book to that spot of your house and I want you to see if you can comfortably read in that spot. If you can, then a plant will probably do just fine there as long as it is a medium to lower light plant. If you are having trouble reading in that spot from the natural light, then it's definitely not going to be enough light for a plant to survive even if it is a low light plant. Now we're going to talk about shopping for the right plants. As I've mentioned before, a lot of the reason people bring home plants that die within a few weeks is because they're not paying attention to what kind of plant they're grabbing. They see something beautiful and they bring it home, which is such an easy thing to do, but it's extremely important that you are considering what that plant needs before you bring it home. Most of the time, a plant will have a care card on it and that will tell you basics of what it needs, how much water, how much light, but a lot of the time that tag will say, indirect bright light. And what exactly is indirect bright light? This can be pretty misleading, especially when a lot of plants have that indirect bright light tag. The good news is you can tell a lot about what a plant needs as far as care, water, and light based on the leaf structure. And I actually learned this in a Bloom and Grow Radio episode with Summer Rain Oaks. It was all about how to ID a plant without actually knowing what the plant is called. I'll link that episode down below. It was really, really helpful for me. So the first thing that I want to talk about regarding leaf structure is you can tell a lot about a plant's watering needs based on their leaf thickness. So this is a peperomia frost, and this is a pretty popular and common peperomia. If you can't find this exact variety, you could find something that looks very similar to this, just in a different color. I'm bringing out this plant because the leaves are very thick. They almost feel like a succulent. If you've ever felt a succulent leaf, they are very plump and full of water. Basically, this plumpness is an indication to tell us that this plant can retain water for a long period of time. I really don't have to water this plant very often at all, and when I do have to water it, I notice that the leaves are much floppier. So at this point in its watering cycle, I watered it just a few days ago, and if I was to try to bend this leaf, it would probably snap the leaf. 
Had I done that a few days ago before I watered it, I would have been able to bend this leaf pretty easily. Okay, so that is the difference between a thicker leaf and a thin leaf. This plant retains water because the leaves are thicker. Now let's look at a plant that is in contrast to this plant, which is a Syngonium holly. This plant's leaves are much thinner. It feels like a thin layer of plastic. I can bend these leaves super easily. So that lets me know that it can't retain as much water as a Peperomia can. You can also tell how much water a plant can retain by the thickness of their branches or their stems. This Syngonium's branches are just a little bit thicker than other types of plants that need frequent waterings. So I know that even though this plant has thin leaves, it does retain a little bit more moisture than other plants with thinner leaves and thinner stems like a fern, for example which I don't even own a fern because I know that I could never keep up with that watering. <laughs> the next trait that you can tell from a plant's leaves is how much light it needs. For example, I have brought out the quintessential dark plant. This is a ZZ Raven, and as you can see, the leaves are so dark that they actually appear black. Now to avoid getting super sciency on you because that is obviously not my forte, this plant is darker, which means that it can absorb more light. Think of it like a black hole. Black holes are dark and they suck in everything. <laughs> so because these leaves are darker, it has the ability to bring in so much more light than a plant with, let's say, white leaves. I'm bringing out the Syngonium holly again just to show you an example, but the difference in the colors of these leaves is really, really important. So this leaf, since there is not as much green on it, not as much dark green space, that means that it needs to be closer to the window or in a brighter light situation so that it has more opportunities to photosynthesize. The green spaces on your leaves are the spots where that plant is sucking in all of the nutrients from the light. So when a plant has a lot of it, there's a lot of opportunities to get that light, and when they don't have that much, there's less opportunities. So in order for plants like this Syngonium holly to thrive, I put it in a situation where it's getting a lot of light. And this plant right here probably doesn't need to go in a south window. It would probably actually be really happy in a north window. I currently have it sitting about 10 feet pulled back from an east window and it is very happy there. If you choose to ignore these characteristics on the plant, you might be bringing home a plant to its own funeral. So definitely make sure that you are being mindful about your plant purchases before you make them so that you're not wasting money and time and a plant. We've all killed so many, I'm sure, I know that I have, but let's try to limit that by being mindful of our plant purchases. The next thing that I wanna talk about today is choosing the right pot. Now, pottery is a very fun thing about plants. It's a way to decorate your plant, and I think a lot of the time new plant parents can get distracted by all of the pretty pots and forget that this is actually where the plant is going to live and it needs to be a suitable environment for the plant. So the pot that this ZZ Raven is sitting in is a terracotta pot, and terracotta usually looks just like this, maybe a few different shades of orange, but typically it is a clay orange pot. And actually, I would say about 90% of my collection lives in terracotta. Number one, because it is extremely inexpensive. And number two, it's beautiful, obviously. And number three, because my plants have really, really enjoyed it. I really love terracotta pots because this pot is made of clay, which means that it is very porous. So excess water not only comes out of the drainage hole at the bottom, but is wicked away through the clay itself. So a lot of the time you will see terracotta pots that have little deposits and white, it's called patina, and it just looks really, really cool. This one doesn't have it actually, I really don't know why, but let's see if I have one with it. What's this one? Mm, you can't really see it on that one. So there we go. As you can see, there are like these white deposits here at the bottom of the pot, and that is basically just from salts and minerals being absorbed into the clay and drying there. It's not harmful for the plant at all, and it actually looks really cool. So that is a few of the reasons that I really, really prefer terracotta. And I think above all, I think that the price is why I like terracotta the most because pottery can easily be the most expensive part of plants, even more than the plants themselves. Now some plants, for example, Calatheas or Marantas, really, really do enjoy a ceramic pot. And the reason for that is because it doesn't let the excess water come through the pores of the soil. It stays in the soil so that the soil remains moist longer. So that might be nice for you if you have any of those types of plants. But the number one thing that I would say in your pottery shopping journey is you must, I repeat, you must, this is something that I am instilling on you, this is a rule that you have to follow. You must have a drainage hole if you are going to be potting the plant 
directly into the pot. This drainage hole right here is pretty big. The bigger the drainage hole, honestly, the better. You can put a small piece of mesh at the bottom of here so that the soil doesn't come out when you're watering or when the pot is just sitting here. Sometimes the soil can come out the bottom. There are a few different reasons that you absolutely need a drainage hole, in my opinion. The first reason being that it is so important for excess moisture to leave the pot in some way. When you water your plant, you're not dumping a small cup of water on the plant. You want to soak your plant really, really well, and we'll talk about that when I get to watering, but you want to soak that plant thoroughly so that the water comes out the drainage hole. There is no way that you could thoroughly water a plant without drainage because the water would stay stuck in that pot. I have seen YouTubers like Plantarina give the advice if you are going to plant a small plant in a drain, drain holeless, <laughs> in a pot without drainage, you water the plant, let it percolate through the bottom, and once that is finished, you would just turn the pot on its side and let the water drain out like this. That is something that you can do with a smaller plant, but as Plantarina said in her Plant 101 video, you definitely aren't going to be able to do that with your bigger plants. Another reason why pots with drainage are extremely important in your collection is because when you water with tap water, our tap water has salt and minerals in them. And that is not necessarily a bad thing for certain plants. Calatheas and Marantas have other ideas. They don't really like that. So if you have a Calathea or a Maranta, definitely try watering it with rainwater or distilled water and see if that improves the life of your plant. But other than that, all of those salts and minerals will stay in your pot if you don't allow the water to drain out the bottom. That can cause a lot of issues for your plant later down the line and it's just not worth the stress. So if you do happen upon a pot without drainage that you really like, it's okay, you can still buy it. But I would just suggest instead of planting the plant <laughs> directly into the pot, just set the nursery pot inside of the pot, if that makes sense. I'm saying pot a lot right now. I have an example that I can show you. This plant is no longer in the nursery pot, it's actually in a terracotta pot, but I really, really liked this cash po and I wanted to use it. So this is a non-draining cash po. There is no drainage hole, but I can just pop my plant that has a drainage hole into here and it's perfect. So whenever I want to water, I just remove this plant from the cash po, take it to the sink and water it. And once it's all drained out, I'll put it back in here and it can look super pretty. There are also a lot of tutorials on YouTube for drilling your own drainage hole into a ceramic pot. I personally probably will never take the time to do that. It really doesn't matter to me that much. I would rather just use a ceramic pot as a cash po. And since most of my plants are in terracotta anyway, I don't have the issue of needing to drill my own drainage holes. One last tip on pottery that I did not take seriously for a long time is that you cannot forget the saucer. It's only a few extra bucks and it will definitely keep your surfaces safe. Sometimes the excess moisture in the pot can cause damage on your furniture. And also it's just kind of messy when soil is coming out the bottom of the pot and it's just sitting on your countertop or your windowsill or whatever it may be. The last thing that we're gonna talk about today in Houseplants 101, I hope that you're still with me and enjoying this video, we are going to be talking about watering. Water is, second to light, the most important thing that your plant needs. As I mentioned before, a lot of plants are perfectly happy with tap water, and I will say that Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, has some of the worst tap water ever. I don't even drink it, it's super disgusting, but my plants are very happy with it, with the exception of a couple of Calatheas and Anthuriums, but those are my special plants and they're in a different category. <laughs> so we're gonna do a little bit of an analogy here, a little teaching technique that I picked up. Think of your soil as a dry sponge. Dry sponges do not absorb water the first second that you splash water on them. It takes just a little bit of time for the water to infiltrate the sponge, and that's totally okay. That is a normal thing that we have come to terms with, and it is the exact same thing with plants. Soil, when it is hard and packed in, it can get super, super tough to get the water through the soil. A big mistake that a lot of people make, and myself included in this, when I first started out with plants, I would notice, I would water my plant and I would see the water coming out the bottom drainage hole really fast. So I thought two things. Number one, I thought that my soil was awesome and super well draining. And number two, I thought that the plant had gotten its fill on water and when in fact, it didn't at all. So a technique that I learned from a few different people out there in the plant world is to loosen up that soil on the top layer of your plant. And I've actually made a video about this, so I will link it in the cards and down in the description box below, basically talking about how I water my plants. But something that I do is I aerate the soil by taking something in this 
general shape. So you could use a chopstick, you could use a knitting needle. This is a paintbrush that I don't use. <laughs> so I use this to aerate the soil on my plants. Basically what I mean when I say that I aerate the soil is I'm breaking up that top layer of soil so that the sponge is a little bit softer and it can absorb water a lot faster. This is especially important where I live because as I've mentioned, there's a lot of salts and minerals in my water. So sometimes there can be a very thick, heavy, dense layer at the top of the soil and it's just important for the plant to be able to move through the soil. So loosening up that top layer is super important, at least for me. To water your plants the most efficiently, you need to make sure that the water is coming out of that drainage hole and not just falling off to the side. Because oftentimes that soil, when it gets dry, it all shrinks together. So there's all these spaces around the edge of that pot. So you want to make sure that you adequately saturate your plant, like dump water. You can never overwater a plant by giving it too much water in one side. Sitting. That is a huge myth in plants. There is no such thing as overwatering a plant in one sitting. A plant becomes overwatered when that soil stays too moist for too long, meaning that you are watering it too often. If you do end up with excess water in your saucers, you can use a turkey baster to grab all of the extra moisture from that saucer because you definitely don't want your plant to reabsorb that or sit in it either. Because even though plants like moist soil, they definitely don't want to sit in a puddle of water. So that will be all for my Houseplant 101 video. Thank you so much for watching. Before I go, I do want to say, please don't be discouraged if you have a history of being a plant killer. All of us are plant killers. We've all killed a plant or 12 in our experiences here. And I want you to know that green thumbs, you know that, that myth that green thumbs just pop up out of nowhere? It's not true. Green thumbs are something that are acquired and learned through many years of practice and trial and error. So please be encouraged that houseplants are for you. There's just a lot to learn. If you have stuck around this long, I do have a little gift for you if you are interested. It is this little houseplant care booklet that I made specifically for my subscribers. I hope that if this was helpful for you that you will click the link in my bio and download this for free. It is basically a written version of most of the things that I just said, but it also has a repotting section. So if you are interested in learning more about repotting, this little booklet will have a section on repotting. It is just the absolute basics on houseplant care, and if you are getting started with this, I think that it'll be really helpful for you to have this guide to have in your pocket or next to the windowsill with your plants so that you can do some reading while you're taking care of them. Again, thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to check out the links in the description for the videos that I mentioned and also download this beautiful free plant care booklet. <laughs> I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you so much. Bye!